Yes, it's recording. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Today we have two speakers presenting in our webinar. We have Daniele Durante and Sirio Legramanti. Daniel is an assistant professor of statistical science in the Department of Decision Sciences at Bucconi University in Italy. His research interests focus on network science, Bayesian methods and computations, categorical data, and latent variables models. We also have Sirio, who is an assistant professor in statistics at the department of, uh, professor in statistics at the University of uh, Bergamo, also in Italy. His research interests include Bayesian statistics, dimensionality reduction, networks, approximate Bayesian computation, and privacy. The title of their talk today is Bayesian non-parametric uh, factorizations of matrix valued parameters. Daniele and Sirio, thank you for accepting this invitation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Felipe for the very kind introduction and also a big thank to the whole BNP section for inviting us to give this talk. Uh, it's really a great pleasure, both for me and Sirio, um, also because it gives us the opportunity to present, let's say, uh, some of the recent research we have been doing in the past year on Bayesian modeling of matrix valued parameters, and in particular on factorization of these parameters uh, using, uh, let's say, more standard and less standard implementation of ideas from Bayesian non-parametrics. As you can see in this slide, the previous one, sorry. Um, so this talk will mainly comprise two contributions. Uh, the first one is more applied. Uh, the focus is in, in particular on criminal networks encoding information about connectivity patterns among criminals. And it's kind of motivated by the fact that in uh, current forensic studies, uh, most of the analysis rely, let's say, on overly restrictive models, on algorithms, that actually rule out fundamental patterns that typically occur within criminal organization. And so this gives, let's say, a kind of overly simplistic and sometimes even biased reconstruction of the modular architecture of criminal organization from the analysis of criminal networks. Uh, we thought that this was kind of dangerous and therefore we decided to uh, cover this gap by combining a broad class of formulations for model-based clustering of nodes characterized by similar connectivity behavior within network these are the stochastic block model with a similarly broad set of priors for random partition from Bayesian non-parametrics, which are Gibbs type priors. This led to what we call extended stochastic block models. So this is a broad class of formulation for learning modules uh, within networks, which let's say unifies several previous versions of stochastic block model, and at the same time extend them in many interesting directions, some also new ones, which has never appeared in the network context. And as you will see later on, they provide a much better reconstruction of real criminal network, especially when compared uh, with analysis coming mainly from forensic studies. Uh, the second contribution instead is, let's say, uh, more methodological and in a way is broader in scope. And the focus is on overcomplete representation and in particular on overcomplete matrix factorization and on how we induce, let's say, suitable shrinkage within this construction. So as you know, uh, anytime we deal with matrix valued parameter or with factorization of these matrix valued parameters, typically the underlying rank of the matrix is unknown uh, and therefore we need to specify it. So in this setting, a convenient idea is to rely on over complete representation. So where we specify the rank uh, to a conservative value, sometimes even potentially infinite, and then we combine this construction with shrinkage prior, which are able to delete, let's say, uh, the redundant components which we've added in our model. Clearly in this setting, the question is, how do we induce suitable shrinkage in this case? Now, if you think about the classical uh, matrix factorization that we have in statistics, like principal component or the factorization that we get from covariance matrices induced by factor models or more generally eigen decomposition, typically the columns in this factorization are kind of ordered in decreasing order, for example, as measured by the eigenvalues. So clearly what we wanted to do here is to include this, uh, let's say information about ordering in the type of importance in modeling these uh, high dimensional matrix valid parameters uh, through what we call cumulative shrinkage process. So this is basically nothing but a sequence of spike and slab distribution for the parameter which are regulating uh, the importance of each column in defining our factorization, uh, which is based again on a sequence of spike and slab distribution where the mass which we assign to the spike grows as the model complexity increases. 
And the way in which we induce this, uh, let's say, process of assigning increasing mass to the spy is done through um, a cumulative sum of steep breaking probability. So a kind of, let's say, less standard implementation of Bayesian ideas. However, this construction was um, very interpretable um, in terms of also parameter settings. It was, it is, um, let's say, principal and there's also theoretical support. And as we will see later on, uh, it's quite kind of flexible in learning the rate through which we should delete redundant components from data. So we will see uh, some of these empirical results later on by focusing on factor models. So as you can understand, these two contributions are kind of different in nature, in the sense that they deal with different types of data, different objects, and also different models. However, they have two main things in common. The first one is that, as I was mentioning before, both of them clearly deal with matrix valued parameters. So in one case, we have the matrix of edge probabilities in network data. In the other case, we typically have covariance matrices, which we want to factorize. And this type of data uh, of parameters in modern application are increasingly high dimensional. They are often sparse, or at least it makes sense to, uh, to uh, say that they admit a low dimensional representation. This is, for example, what we induce with stochastic block models for network data. So in these models, basically, we assume that the edges, which comprise our adjacency matrix Y, are conditioned independent realization from Bernoulli random variable, whose edge probabilities containing the matrix pi only depend on the cluster assignment of the two involved nodes. So based on this assumption, now it's clear why we induce a factorized representation of our matrix of edge probabilities. The form you can see it here. So it's made by this first matrix, which is a matrix of dimension B, so the number of nodes in our network and A times H, the number of clusters. And each row here is basically telling us uh, from which group the associated node is coming from. So it's a row full of zero, except for a single one in the position uh, to, of the cluster to which that node belonged to. Then we multiply this matrix by the matrix theta. So this is the matrix of block probabilities. So it's of, of dimension capital, capital H times capital H, and the generic element theta hk is measuring the probability of a connection between a generic node in cluster h and a generic node in cluster k. And then we multiply this quantity by the transpose of the first matrix. The other example is factor models. Uh, in this case, we obtain a, factor, a factorized representation for the covariance matrix. So this is the covariance matrix for a vector of p measurements for a statistical unit y contained in the vector, in the vector y. And here we assume that these vectors, so these measurements, can be written as a linear combination of a low dimensional vector of latent factors of dimension h according to uh, the parameters, so to a set of weights containing the matrix of loadings lambda. So now it's clear that if we assume that the latent factors are distributed as a multivariate standard normal and we marginalize them out, this yields to a factorized representation for our covariance matrix omega which is the one that you see here. So it's the matrix of factor loading times its transpose plus a diagonal matrix, which is the uh, covariance matrix of the noise term. So as you can see from these two examples of different construction, uh, the other key thing that the previous contribution have in common is that in both settings, we don't know age. So in one case, we don't know how many clusters there are in our network. And here, we don't know how many latent factors there are within our factor model. So the question is, how do we specify age in practice, or how can we learn it? Well, there are lots of uh, research along this direction, and a lot have been done, both in the past year and the most, more recent year. And there are several uh, solutions. There are ranking from, let's say, more heuristic one to other based on model selection criteria, and other is more uh, fully model-based. So I guess we all know, for example, the elbow rule. Um, which we use, for example, in principal component analysis, but also in factor model. This is more, uh, is practically useful. However, it's more heuristic, even if in this case, even this elbow rule contains this idea of increasing or actually decreasing importance of later columns, which we will try to include in a more model-based version later on. So being more heuristic, sometimes we would like to have some more principal procedure. One is to fit the model for multiple values of age and then pick up the one with the lowest value of a given information criteria, like for example, AAC or BAC. So clearly this has the problem of refitting the model multiple times. And in a way, it doesn't fully quantify uncertainty on age. If we want to do that, one possibility is, well, let's just place a prior on age and try to learn its posterior along with that of the other parameter as a result of our Bayesian updating. Uh, this clearly is fully a Bayesian approach, which quantifies uncertainty on age. 
It's kind of related also to the idea of mixer or finite mixer, but it may raise some computational challenges when implemented the MCMC, uh, because, for example, our near identifiability problems or mixing problems. A more practical version, which has been considered a lot in the recent year, is well, let's just avoid specifying age. Let's just rely on an overcomplete representation where we, we fix age at a conservative value, potentially even infinity. And then we combine this construction with shrinkage prior, which are able to delete the redundant components which we have added to our model. Uh, this is a, in a way more flexible, it's also supported by theory. Uh, there is another uh, nice article by Judith Rousseau and Carrie Mangerson on this topic. However, again, it raised some question on how we induce suitable shrinkage in this setting. Uh, what you will see later on are basically two ways in which we try to contribute mainly to point three and four uh, from different perspectives. So let me immediately go to the uh, first contribution. So the title of this article is Extended Stochastic Block Models with Application to Criminal Networks. Uh, it has been recently accepted in the Annals of Applied Statistics and it's written in collaboration with Asirio, uh, Tommaso Rigor, and David Danson. So as I was mentioning before here, the motivation, so it's an applied work mainly, uh, with a specific motivation which comes from the analysis of criminal network and actually real world criminal network. Uh, the one which we will focus on mainly is the network that you see represented here. Uh, this is a real criminal network of a mafia organization operating in Italy, uh, which I will discuss more in detail later on. Uh, what I want to highlight here is that each node represents a suspect uh, belonging to the criminal organization, and there is a connection between two suspects if they attended at least once one of the meetings of the criminal organization as reported by police investigation. So as you can understand, this type of data are extremely important in criminology and forensic studies because from their analysis, we may have a better idea about uh, the structure and both the vertical and horizontal architecture of uh, criminal organization. And in particular, there has been recent evidence that the modules, so the group of nodes having similar connectivity behavior within this network are extremely important to uncover, uh, let's say the hidden hierarchy within criminal organization. Clearly, uh, of course, if we want to learn these modules, uh, which is very much important, we require some innovations, especially relative to what is mainly done in forensic analysis. Uh, the first key one is that this network, in particular, the edges that we monitor are subject to measurement error. Uh, the idea is that these are a result of police investigation, which due to time constraint or to difficulties in, modded in uh, let's say monitoring some of the meeting, uh, may lead to some false negative or some false positive in the edge that we observe. So clearly here, uh, using a purely algorithmic approach, as mainly done, for example, in forensic studies, is kind of less ideal, because what we would really like to do is to have a model-based approach to modeling this type of data, which is able to quantify even the measurement error within such a network. Another problem of the algorithmic approach, which is mainly used in forensic studies, is that currently used algorithms are mainly looking for communities. So group of suspects tightly interconnected within and with few connections across. And this is clearly not what is typically happening in criminal networks where we typically observe much more complex block structure. For example, we observe a lot of core periphery patterns between the suspect and the bosses, sorry, the affiliate and the bosses. We may also observe weak community patterns among the bosses in order to hide from police investigation. So it's clear that here we really want a model which is able to account for more general block structure beyond just communities. The final point is that often these data come also with information about suspect, uh, as again recorded by police investigation, and sometimes this information uh, may be useful in supervising the detection of these models. So in a way, we would like to include this type of external node attributes within our statistical model in a principal manner, and potentially we would like also to quantify uncertainty even in the node attributes, because also these quantities are, are, are error prone since they are a result from, of police investigation. So all this discussion, just to say that the stochastic block model is definitely a good building block in our construction. So this is a very popular statistical model, uh, which again, model the probabilistic generative mechanism of an adjacency matrix Y through which we represent the network. So basically in this matrix, we put the node on the rows and on the columns so that each element correspond to a pair of nodes and that element will be either one or zero, depending on whether we observe or do not observe a connection among those two nodes. Now in modeling the probabilistic generative mechanism underlying this adjacency matrix, stochastic block model basically 
attached to each node an indicator telling us from which group that node is coming from, and then condition on, the, on this uh, node membership indicator, they assume that the edges are condition independent randomization from Bernoulli random variable was probability only depend on the assignment, on the cluster assignment of the two involved nodes. So just to formalize this a bit, if we denote with theta hk the block probability, so the probability of an edge between a generic node in cluster H and a generic node in cluster K, then the likelihood for our adjacency matrix is what you see here. So factorizes the product of Bernoulli probabilities, where as you can see, these probabilities all depend on the cluster assignment of the two involved nodes. We can of course collapse across pairs of blocks to end up with this second beta binomial, like, uh, sorry, binomial likelihood where MHK and bar MHK are the number of edges and non edges between uh, nodes in group H and K. So in performing Bayesian inference on this type of model, a common assumption is to rely on independent beta priors for the block probabilities. And then in general, these quantities are typically marginalized out from the likelihood because our main goal is to perform posterior inference on the vector Z, which is the vector of dimension B that contains the node assignment so the assignment of different nodes to clusters. Uh, luckily, I mean, we can leverage beta binomial conjugacy, which allow us to obtain a closed form likelihood for the agency symmetric Y just condition on the vector Z. And it's this beta binomial form. So clearly now all the game is how do we choose a prior for Z, which boils down into choosing a prior for a random partition. Of course, we have many options and actually, uh, based on the different option which has been chosen so far in the literature, this has led to different version of stochastic block model. For example, the more classical one is to rely on a Dirichlet multinomial prior for Z. What we are doing here is implicitly, we're assuming that bar H, so the total possible number of clusters um, among nodes within the whole population of nodes is finite and fixed. The assumption to be finite may be not that wrong. And in fact, we will make this later on. However, assuming that it's fixed and known clearly is kind of analytic in most studies. And therefore, what you would like to do is, for example, to quantify uncertainty or some bar H by putting a prior on that. And this will lead to, for example, the mixture of finite mixture version of stochastic block model. Alternatively, we may just say, well, bar H is infinity. So in a way, we are going to a kind of potentially overcomplete representation. And this yield to the infinite relational uh, model, okay? Where we are basically assuming a Chinese restaurant process prior for that. So at this point, being an applied article, what we ask ourselves is, well, can we identify a unified framework for all these prior work, which contain all this version as a special case, but it's more broader and potentially may allow us to identify even better ones for our criminal network, but even develop broad computational tools uh, an inference method which allow us, for example, to select which one is the best for our construction in a principal manner. So we really wanted to have a unified framework which could potentially be applied in general. And the answer was pretty easy because it's simple to notice that all these priors are just example of Gibbs type priors. So this is a broad class of priors uh, for random partition coming from Bayesian non-parametric, which have a common form for the probability mass function, which you see here. So it depends on a vector, sorry, on a weight parameter, which is indexed by the size of the network and on the number of current cluster within Z. And at the same time, it respects some recursive formula in its construction. And then the remainder term factorized as the product of cluster specific components, which depend on, a, on a discount parameter sigma. And as you can see here on the size of the cluster and H. So I won't go too much into the detail of this construction since I will focus much more on the Ur mechanism induced by that. Uh, there is a very nice review about Gibbs type prior by Pierpaolo de Blasi and co-authors, if you're interested on that. What we simply do here instead is, well, let's just assume, so let's try to be general uh, as a starting point, and let's just assume that Z is a Gibbs type prior, okay? So that based on the choice of the sequence of weights on the discount parameter, we can recover the previous construction as special cases but potentially, as you will see later on, we may be also allowed to explore new alternatives and include within a general construction, uh, the different version of Gibbs type prior, which allow, for example, bar H to be finite and fixed, finite and random and infinite, and to check which one is the best for our criminal network. So as I was telling you before, uh, the Gibbs type prior are very nice and elegant, also because they have a simple mechanism associated with them. 
through this old mechanism is basically telling us how we can generate a vector z from such a Gibbs side prior in a sequential manner, generating the cluster assignment of one node at a time, conditional on the cluster assignment of the previous one. For example, as you can see here, is the old mechanism associated with the cluster assignment of a new incoming node V plus one. And as you can see here, it depends. So we can either assign it to a currently observed cluster with this probability, which depends, as you can see, on the size, on the current size of the cluster, discounted by the parameter sigma and multiplied by the associated weight. Otherwise, we can assign it to a new cluster currently not observed in the previous nodes. So by the choice of the sequence of weights and discount parameter, this allow us to recover all the specific example of the Gibbs type prior we discussed before. And as a result, recover all the previous version of stochastic block model, which appear in the literature as a special case. For example, we can obtain uh, the Dirichlet multinomial wood mechanism, the pitman yor one, the Dirichlet process, or even new version, for example, the Gnadin process. So this is a very nice example of mixer of finite mixer. So it's basically a Dirichlet multinomial with a prior on bar H, which has been never uh, implemented in stochastic block model. But as you will see later on, it has a very nice uh, and very good performance in practice. And the reason here is that in a way, the prior that the gradient process induced on bar H as a mode at one and he details. So it's kind of shrinking toward low dimensional interpretable construction uh, but at the same time, we maintain EV tail in order to be robust, for example, to network where we have a big number of clusters. At the same time, as you can see here, it has a closed form expression for the wood mechanism, which may allow simple implementation of deep sampling algorithms. But before going to them, I also want to show you how we can include in a simple way attributes within such priors. So as I was mentioning before, sometimes we may have node attributes, which may be useful to inform or, uh, or to better to supervise the way in which we are, <clears throat> we are detecting modules. And in this case, using Gibbs type prior is very convenient because they have a direct uh, connection with product partition models, which allow us to include uh, information from attributes in a very simple manner. So there is a very nice article by Peter Mueller and co-author about the PPMX idea, which is basically the one that we inherit here in the context of network. And this is very simple because, as you can see here, so if we want to include the information from attributes, uh, we just need to slightly modify the previous probability mass function to include within its cluster specific factor this term, P of XH, where XH are the attributes for the node in cluster H, whereas this function P is basically controlling the contribution of X to the cluster cohesion. And this is done by favoring groups which are homogeneous with respect to the node attributes. This is very elegant, even more in the context of network because network typically are characterized by the homophily property. So the tendency of nodes to behave the same if they have at, like, uh, similar attributes. So this is actually the way in which we're including the homophily property also in a very, let's say, in a probabilistic manner. So this, uh, let's say, result that you see here clarifies even more how we are including this sort of homophily property by looking at the example in which we have a single categorical attribute as in our uh, application, as we will see later on. If we have a single categorical attribute, then we can use the Dirichlet multinomial cohesion function. And what you see here, this is the old mechanism, the induced old mechanism that we obtain by such an assumption. It's the same as the one for the, say, unsupervised Gibbs type prior, but we now inflate these probabilities according to rescale risk this probability according to this term that you can see here, which, as you can see, it depends on a quantity NH XV plus one. So it, it depends on how many nodes we have in cluster H, which have the same covariate value of the new node which we want to assign. So what we are doing here is we are effectively inflating the probability of the cluster, which contain node that have an attribute similar to the one that we want to assign. So we're favoring this sort of cohesion by attribute, which is very elegant and includes the homophily property that we typically observe in network. The other nice thing is that what you can prove easily is that by choosing a Dirichlet multinomial cohesion function on X, the underlying what we are assuming is implicitly a joint model for the network and the covariate based on a common partition underlying. So in a way, implicitly, what we are doing is also quantify uncertainty in error prone node attributes. So what about posterior computation and inference? 
This can be done in a very simple manner because we have a closed form expression for the old mechanism associated with our Gibbsi priors. At the same time, we also have a closed form expression for the likelihood given the vector Z. So this implies that we will also have a closed form expression for the, for the full conditional probability of assigning a node to cluster given the assignment of all the others. And this allows us to develop a very simple deep sampling algorithm which cycle across node and every time basically we stand up a node and reassign it to cluster based on this uh, closed form expression for the full conditional probabilities. Uh, what about posterior inference? So this was uh, mainly a, an article motivated by uh, an applied problem. So we really wanted also to provide to practitioner, uh, let's say principal methods to perform posterior inference based on the sample that we got from our MCMC. Uh, so these samples are partitions. So what we really wanted to do is to provide with this principal method that allow posterior inference directly on the space of partition. And in this respect, we found that this, the decision theoretic approach proposed by a nice article by Wade and Garamani was very useful uh, in order to provide inference on random partition directly within that space. So here it is to rely on the variation of information metric as a metric direct on the space of random partition, which allow us to derive principal point estimate for Z and also uncertainty uh, quantification via credible goals. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do, since we have this broad class, which comprise multiple possible choice and example of Gibbs I prior, is to understand which one we should choose in a given application to criminal networks. So we, really, we wanted also methods to compare these different type, these different priors, which is basically going back to comparing different models. We could rely on the base factor, but this requires us to compare, to compute the marginal likelihood, so to sum across partition, uh, which was, I mean, too much cumbersome. So we rely on the WAIC as a model selection criteria to pick up which prior is the best for a given application. So we have done several simulation studies, which I kept as backup slide in case we want to discuss later on. What I want to do here is to go immediately to the application also because the results that we obtain from the application are very similar to those that we got in the simulation studies. So just to go back to the application to our criminal networks, I just want to provide you a few more information about that network. So as I was mentioning before, that network is a real mafia network. It's actually associated with a mafia organization, which is very much rooted and operating a lot in Italy, but also internationally. It's very much structured and very difficult to untangle. And Therefore, this motivated us to have a better idea because it's very much, let's say, structured hierarchically uh, in vertical sense, it goes in horizontal one, and it's uh, very much deeply rooted in the territory. Uh, together with this information, we also have information, some information about the different suspects. In particular, we know whether the police think whether each suspect is just an affiliate or a boss, so we know the role as thought by police, and we also know membership to locality. So locally in this mafia organization, which is Ndrangheta, means subgroups which are operating crime in a specific territory. So as you can understand, these two information may be very useful in order to uh, say improve and supervise our detection of modules within the network. However, they may not necessarily overlap with this attribute, the module that we will observe. And this is what we will see later on. So here in this table, you just see some analysis for the different Gibbs type prior that I was discussing before. So this include uh, prior with uh, bar H uh, finite and fixed, like Dirichlet multinomial, with bar H infinite, like DP and Pit Mayor, or with bar H finite and fixed, sorry, finite and random. As you can see here, it seems that based on the WAC, the Gnadism process is having the better performance in this case. And this makes too much sense based on the type of network which we are analyzing, because this, again, is a very well-structured criminal organization. So we don't expect that in the whole population of, no, of possible suspects, the number of modules will go to infinity. We expect that this is finite. At the same time, we don't know it. Uh, so we want to put a prior on that, which is what the Gnadin process does. As expected also, by supervising with this information about locali, we get a further improvements uh, in the WAC. So it seems that here, the supervised netting process prior is giving us the best performance in practice. In this picture, instead, you see the performance of the netting process prior, which is the third uh, plot that you see here on the very, on the right, compared to other algorithms that are currently mainly using forensic studies. 
So the first one is what you get by applying the Louvain algorithm, which mainly looks for communities. The second, the middle one is what we obtain by applying spectral clustering. And the final one is again, what we obtain by applying our supervised netting process prior. So clearly here, the improvements are pretty uh, evident in the sense that we learn a much a finer partition of our network, where we are also able to identify modules where which the other meter will not be able to recover. Especially what you see here is we're able to recover these sort of core periphery patterns between uh, the affiliates of each locale and their own bosses. At the same time, we're also able to recover these sort of weak community patterns among the bosses in order to hide from police investigation. So this picture clarified the result even more. So in this network, each node is one of the cluster that we identify. The size is proportional to how many suspects have been allocated to that cluster, whereas the pie chart represents the composition with respect to locali and goal. In particular, the different color mean different locali. Uh, you will see a darker color if we are referring to a boss and lighter one if we are referring to an affiliate. And what we get here is pretty interesting in the sense that we ob observe this sort of core periphery pattern structure where the group of affiliates are bigger and denser and are placed at the periphery, whereas the group of bosses are smaller um, and are at the core. And as you can see here, each affiliate connects to the core only through the bosses of their own locale, which in turn display these sort of weak community patterns. And at the end, they connect with a single tone. Uh, no, a cluster which contain only one node, which I will discuss later on. So what I was saying here is even more clear in this second picture. Well, what we did is for each cluster, we computed the average betweenness among the node belonging to that cluster and the average local transitivity among the node belonging to that cluster, and then we represented them. As you can see here, the cluster of bosses are characterized by a much higher value for the betweenness. This means that they are fundamental to guarantee the flow of information within the network. At the same time, they have very small local transitivity, which means that they are very much sparsely interconnected. What happened for the affiliates is the opposite. They are at the periphery, and therefore they have much lower betweenness. It means that they are not fundamental in guaranteeing the flow of information within the network, because at the end, as we will see later on, they just administer crime. And to administer crime effectively, instead they have a much higher local transitivity, which means that they are very much tight interconnected. So this is actually one of, let's say, the first empirical evidence that this mafia network is actually very well organized in the sense that it's very much able to address the trade-off between efficiency and security in the organization. And this is done again through the, low, through the creation of this low-sized, sparse and secure group of bosses, okay, with very high betweenness, that favor the flow of information towards much larger and more dense affiliate group, which guarantee efficiency in administering crime. What I want to stress here is this uh, singleton cluster. So this, it seems to be very core, the core one. So it seems to be the boss of the bosses and may actually be the actual boss of the organization since this cluster contains only one node, which actually only speak with bosses in a very sparse manner. And the interesting stuff is that in the police investigation, in the acts of the process, this node was marked as just an affiliate, so not as a boss. Whereas according to our finding, it seems that its role in the vertical organization of Drangheta is much higher. And in fact, what we saw is that this node is one of the oldest members in the organization, which have an uh, important coordinating role, especially between uh, this uh, part of the Drangheta, which is actually the group of Drangheta operating in Milan with the leading Drangheta families in Calabria, so in south of Italy. So it seems that the role, according to our analysis, it may be much more important than expected. So just to conclude this part about uh, criminal networks and extended stochastic block model, again, we were motivated mainly by uh, application to criminal networks. However, this gave us the opportunity to develop a very broad class of extended stochastic block model, thanks to the use of Gibbsi prior, which include very all the most of the previous alternative and extend them to new ones and also facilitate again advancing modeling computation and inference within a unified framework there are of course several possible extension uh, a very simple one is to extend this model to directed bipartite and weighted networks so far we have we deal with just binary and directed ones uh, it shouldn't be difficult in the sense that we just need to play with the likelihood all the rest remain the same 
Uh, also, the inclusion of generic node attributes beyond categorical one is pretty simple. We just need to modify uh, the cohesion function within the Gibbs type construction. Uh, it's less uh, simple to extend to a degree corrected stochastic block model or mixed membership stochastic block model, but this is definitely uh, an extension worth uh, being considered. So what you see here is just the link to the article, which is also available in preprint in the Annals of Applied Statistics website. And here you have the GitHub repository, which contains all the code, which can allow also you to play with the criminal network, but also implement this model for the network that you like the most. So let me now move to the second part uh, before leaving the floor to Sirio. Uh, so this one, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's uh, more methodological and more broad in scope in a way, and it's related to how we use this sort of cumulative shrinkage idea within uh, overcomplete representation. So this is an article that has appeared in Biometrica in 2020 and has been written in collaboration with Sirio and with Dave. So as I was mentioning before, uh, the question here is, how do we induce suitable shrinkage in overcomplete representation, in particular on, in overcomplete matrix factorization? Well, as you know, I mean, shrinkage prior has been mostly developed for high dimensional regression problems or extension of them, where typically there is not a specific form of ordering among the parameters or a form of indexing. Um, however, in many construction, again, as I was mentioning before, in overcomplete matrix representation, this sort of ordering is typically present. Again, as I was mentioning before, in this overcomplete construction, what you expect is that the later uh, dimension will be a less and less important role in defining our final factorization. So clearly the question here is, well, we would actually want to move to, move to increasing shrinkage prior. So prior with a concept of increasing shrinkage as the model dimension grows. And this was our goal within this construction. So this has been much less explored in the literature so far relative to the classical example of shrinkage prior. However, there has been some interesting contribution, especially in the context of factor models. So again, as I was mentioning before, in factor model, we assume that our vector of P measurements for unit I containing the vector Y can be written as a linear combination according to the loading matrix lambda of a smaller dimensional vector of latent factors in the matrix eta I plus an epsilon noise. These factors are assumed to have a multivariate standard normal distribution. The noise is typically assumed to be Gaussian, centered at zero and diagonal covariance matrix. So clearly in this construction, if we marginalize out the latent factor, this yields to a factorized representation for the covariance matrix of Y, uh, which is written here. So lambda, lambda transpose plus sigma. And what you would expect, again, in this construction is that the later latent factors will be less and less important in modeling the dependent structure within Y. Okay, so we expect that there is this sort of ordering in the Latin factors. Again, this is a type of ordering, for example, that we see when we apply the elbow rule or when we order, let's say, the eigenvalues when we're doing principal component analysis. So the question is, how do we induce this increase in shrinkage? So as I was mentioning before, there has been some nice contribution in this direction. One is the contribution by Anil Bambattacharya and David Danson, where they developed this sort of multiplicative gamma process. So here the idea is to assume that the element in the matrix lambda, so the matrix of weights, which are controlling the importance of the latent factor, are Gaussian centered at zero and with a variance with, which depend on a local parameter and a global one, theta h, which is changing across columns. So here, if I want to induce this sort of increasing shrinkage, what I just need to do is to put a prior on theta h such that as the model dimension grows, this prior concentrate more and more toward smaller values such that the Gaussian will center more and more towards zero for the lambda parameter. And this behavior is induced by assuming that the inverse of theta h, so the concept of precision, can be obtained as this cumulative product of gammas, so that as h grows, if I suitably specify a1 and a2, this will be, become larger and larger, the precision, therefore the variance as the number of column grows will become smaller and smaller, and that as a result, the associated lambda parameters, so the weights, will become more and more concentrated towards zero. And this will allow effectively to delete, let's say, redundant latent factors. This is a very nice prior, as I was mentioning before, it has a simple construction, is inducing this idea of increasing shrinkage behavior, especially from, a, from at least in expectation, and there's also nice theoretical guarantees. In particular, you can prove that it induced full support prior on the covariance matrix omega, which also induced full posterior consistency for that. 
However, we believe that uh, there, will, there was still room for improvement. Uh, and in particular, some problem about this prior is that uh, this increasing shrinkage idea is at the moment holding just in expectation, whereas we would like to induce a more stronger idea of ordering distribution. And it was holding only for specific values of A1 and A2, okay? Whereas what we would like to do is to have this idea of increasing shrinkage to hold for any value of the parameters. Also because in this setting, the parameter A1 and A2 in this construction, so in the multiplicative gamma process, have a dual role. On one side, they control the rate of increasing shrinkage. On the other side, they also control the prior for the active factors. So there is this kind of trade-off between the need to maintain a sufficiently diffuse prior for the active terms, but at the same time, to induce this kind of increasing shrinkage behavior to effectively delete the redundant ones. So this is what we try to do. So we try to have a kind of different prior, which was kind of addressing this aspect, which is the cumulative shrinkage process, and which is what Celia will, will tell you now. Okay, so shall I share my screen? Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, thank you. So thank you, Daniele, for uh, giving the whole context and describing how it works so well. And to the organizers, of course, and everybody listening online, and to our co-authors as well, Tommaso and David. So, <clears throat> Daniele has set up the context, as I said, so I will move to our proposal of an increasing shrinkage prior, which is named the cumulative shrinkage process. It's a prior designed for sequences of real valued parameters, say theta1, theta2, and so on. And you can think of the parameter theta h to be the parameter controlling the effect or the impact of dimension h. So if you want to, let's say, delete dimension 8, and discard it, then you, uh, you'd you like to shrink this parameter theta h towards some suitable target value theta infinity that depends on, on the model, of course. So uh, we define uh, the cumulative shrinkage process as follows. We say that a sequence theta of these parameters, theta 1, theta 2, and so on, is distributed according to a cumulative shrinkage process with a positive parameter alpha, starting slab distribution, P naught, and target value theta infinity, if conditionally on this other sequence, pi of probabilities, pi one, pi two, and so on, each theta h is independent and has a spike and slab distribution as in these equations. So you see that given the corresponding pi h, theta h is distributed according to a convex mixture of a slab that is named P0 and the spike, which in this case is a delta mass located at the target value theta infinity. And pi h is exactly the weight that we place on the spike. So if you want increasing shrinkage towards theta infinity, you'd like this pi h to be increasing or at least non-decreasing. And there are many ways to, to do that. And the one that we, we chose is to have pi h to be the cumulative sum of non-negative quantities, namely the quantities coming from the stick breaking construction of the Dirichlet process that I guess you're all very familiar with. Okay, so as uh, h grows, pi h increases, and the conditional distribution of, the, of theta h is pushed from the slab towards the spike. And this will correspond to, let's say, the deletion of dimension eight, h, if that's the case. Okay. So before moving to the properties of, let's say, the parameters of interest, the thetas, we have a look at the properties of the corresponding uh, pi's, starting from the flexibility which is guaranteed by our construction. So the prior induced on this sequence of probabilities by one by two and so on, has large support on the whole space of non-decreasing sequences taking values in zero one. And this means that um, our process should be flexible enough to capture all, any possible shrinkage pattern. Moreover, there is this, I guess, nice interpretation of each of these uh, pi's. So you can look at the pi h as the proportion 
of the total variation distance between the slab and the spike that has been covered up to dimension h. Okay, so you can think of it as if the distribution of theta h was moving from the slab towards the spike as h progresses. And this is the distance that has been covered up to step h. Finally, for the pies, we may have a look at the prior expectation of these pies. So recall that pi h is the weight that we place on the spike. So if you want to know which is its expectation, it's a pretty, much, pretty simple computation. And you get that it's just one minus this part that is going to zero exponentially fast as h grows, okay? So the, the speed of this shrinkage is exponential, but of course, it also depends on the value of alpha. If alpha is very large, then the base of this exponential is close to one, so it would be, in a sense, a slower exponential, okay? So moving to the properties of the parameters of interest, so the thetas, we, uh, we have that desired increasing shrinkage for which the whole process was designed. And we have it both in expectation and in probability. So in expectation, we have that the expectation of this theta h goes to theta infinity, again, exponentially fast because this term vanishes exponentially fast. And uh, with the same rate as before, this is just the same ratio that we have seen before, just written more horizontally. And in probability, it's even more interesting in a sense, because we have that also the probability of observing values of theta h that are far away from the target value theta infinity decays exponentially fast. This constant here in front is just the the probability uh, mass put by the slab on uh, values far away from the target value, okay? So, and this implies, of course, that the probability of observing values far away from the target value diminishes as h progresses, okay? So the probability at step h plus one will be smaller than the probability at the previous step. And finally, we have this, property down here, which is probably my, my favorite one in a sense, because it has a, an immediate practical utility in specifying your parameter alpha for the cumulative shrinkage process. So we can expand uh, a little bit the conditional distribution of the thetas like this. So you introduce this Bernoulli CH, which is a Bernoulli with probability one minus pi H and you just expand the conditional distribution, you see that CH becomes the indicator of the slab being selected, okay? So of dimension H being active in a sense. And if you sum up all these indicators, you get the number of active terms or dimensions or factors, whatever. And if you take the expectation of this number of active terms, it turns out that it's just alpha. So if you expect five active dimensions, you set your alpha equal to five and you're kind of, uh, and you're okay, okay? So uh, this is coherent, of course, with this rate of shrinkage, because if you expect many active terms, you will have a very large alpha and this base of the exponential will be close to one. So you will have slower shrinkage. On the contrary, if you expect say, two active terms, this will be two over three, which uh, uh, elevated to power h goes to zero very fast, okay? So uh, we originally in the biometrica paper that Daniele mentioned presented this uh, process for Gaussian factor models because it's a very common setting and it's well known to everybody. But uh, luckily enough, some people have already used it in other contexts matrix decomposition, matrix completion, tensor factorization, Bayesian pyramid, Bayesian expansion. And uh, of course, uh, our proposal of an increasing shrinkage prior is just one of the possibilities. And it can also be seen in a even more general uh, setting and treatment as was done by Schiavon Canal and Danson in this other nice biometrical paper. But 
Let's go back to uh, factor models, Gaussian factor models for illustrative purposes here. So this is the notation that Daniele already used. So since we're kind of a bit running out of time, I will go a bit fast here, but it's just the usual Gaussian factor model that everybody's used to. So compared to, uh, for example, the multiplicative gamma process that uh, Daniele illustrated before, we, we take the same prior on the error variances and inverse gamma. And here we start having some differences. Okay, so you see that the, the prior that we, that we have for each factor loading depends just on uh, this parameter theta h, which is specific to each column. So it's the same parameter across all elements of the column. So for all the factor loadings that correspond to the same factor and it's theta h. So you can already imagine that we place our cumulative shrinkage process on theta h. In particular, we select for uh, convenience and this inverse gamma slab, a quite diffuse inverse gamma, and uh, we set theta infinity to a value very close to zero. In practical implementations, we do not actually use, especially in this factor model setting, an infinite expansion. We kind of truncate at dimension h. You can set h equal to, to p, for example, or uh, to p plus one to be, to be precise, because you do not expect more factors than um, the original dimensionality, okay? So you can truncate just taking what's left of your stick at step h in your stick breaking process. Okay, so uh, luckily enough, the properties, the nice properties that we have on the thetas kind of transfer to, to the factor loadings, which are the actual object of interest here. So we have increasing shrinkage in probability for the factor loadings as well. We have full prior support for uh, induced on the covariance matrix. So the induced prior on the covariance matrix places mass one on the, the matrices with finite entries and that are positive semi-definite. And then um, if you have a decomposition of dimension, which is smaller than your truncation, then our prior will place positive mass around it. Okay. And this results in a posterior weak consistency. In our uh, paper, we proposed a traditional Gibbs sample on which I will not spend time now because it's very standard. And a bit more interestingly, there is this adaptive Gibbs sample that adapts the dimensionality across iterations. So after some, uh, after a certain number of iterations, it starts adapting, and then the rate of adaptation decays exponentially fast again. Um, the adaptation consists in uh, dropping the inactive columns, if you have any, or adding another column, an extra column, if your model is kind of full, okay? So I know this is very brief, but, uh, but I guess you, 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 got, uh, you got the main concept. So in simulations, so we have the simulated data, we know the ground truth, we know the uh, true dimensionality, or at least the dimensionality from which we generated the data, say it's H naught, we take it equal to 5, 10, and 15. You see that uh, as for mean square error, we are kind of on, on par with the multiplicative gamma process that here we took as a, a benchmark, okay? But when it comes to uh, the posterior average of the number of active terms, while we're perfectly able to recover it, uh, there is this tendency in the multiplicative gamma process in uh, overshooting and kind of uh, overestimating it. And this results in, uh, in saving some runtime for us, okay? Because of course, the, the, the fewer dimensions you retain, the faster your computations. So there is also a, a, a tiny uh, real data example. I don't know if we uh, have time, but it's just a, a survey on personality traits. The dimensionality at the beginning is P equal 25. 
it's a small number of relatively small number of individuals. But the nice thing here is that uh, if you look at the posterior uh, mean and quantiles, you see that the posterior coming from our process is able to uh, capture both the correlation within blocks of questions that are related to the same personality trait and also among blocks of questions related to personality traits that it's, um, it's sensible to, to look at as uh, correlated. Okay, so this is uh, coherent with the social science uh, findings and estimates the number of latent factors between two and three. So remember that the starting dimensionality was 25. So just to uh, wrap up, we have proposed the, in this part of the talk and in this paper, the cumulative shrinkage process, which is a, a new increasing shrinkage prior. It's slowly applicable and it has been applied to several contexts beyond factor models, but there are some other interesting ones, uh, such as Poisson factorization that may, be, uh, that may be studied. Another thing is that we treated all the elements within the column in the same way, but one may want to induce some sparsity within columns, and that's also interesting. The last thing is that uh, the adaptive Gibbs sample is already much faster than the standard one, and um, but one uh, should uh, may also work in this direction to improving scalability. I already have uh, a tiny conference paper about this with a variational based implementation of uh, of the cumulative shrinkage process. If you want to have a look at that, so here it's just uh, the link to the paper, which should be open access on Biometrica, but there, it's on archive as well. And again, the code for replicability and if you want to play with it. So I hope uh, I stayed pretty much within the time frame. And of course, we're open to, to questions. Okay, well, let's thank Daniele and Sirio for this great presentation. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> so we have time. Uh, for, for questions. So if you have any questions, comments for Daniele and Sirio, please don't on your mic and go ahead or you can write the questions in the chat. And if somebody's already asking a question, you can also use this a, a raise hand tool in Zoom. We were either too good or too bad. <laughs> <laughs> too good, too clear. <laughs> okay, well, there is not any, any questions. So we can thank our speakers today again for this great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you at, at the next webinar. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Felipe. Felipe bye. Bye bye.